You watch someone get their butt whooped to that song. It is magical. <laughs> oh gosh, that little sack of turds. I know a way that you could die. Drip Eliante pulling up feeling like Harry Belafonte. Look at my racks, feel like Serena went from the back. Hey, what's up? It's me, Mini Mosey. Welcome to my channel. It is finally time for the post war One Piece review. This one was much needed, I'll say. If you watch the latest video that I posted on my channel, the channel update, then you'll know that I decided to start reading One Piece instead of watching it. And I made that decision while I was partway through Fishman Island because it was just taking forever to get through because the pacing like I, I talk about it in the other video so go watch that if you haven't seen it but with the post-war saga that means that I've watched it all the way through already and then I went back and read it and then I am recording this video now so in this video I'm going to talk about the flashback with Ace Sabo and Luffy loneliness the Ace Sabo and Luffy dynamic the nobles one man's trash protecting Luffy, Sabo's death, the Straw Hats and where they are currently, the new world and the new leaders, hockey, and then 3D X2Y or 3D 2Y, however the heck you want to call it, the time skip itself. I'm going to start off talking about how I'm feeling about transitioning from the anime to the manga. So I kind of get like what y'all were saying. Okay, first there's the whole sub versus dub thing. People were always like, watch it, watch it sub, watch it, watch it with subtitles on. And like everybody always says that about everything. Someone asked me, I remember, <laughs> like these were the only two options. They were like, oh, are you reading it or are you watching it with subtitles? It was like, oh no, I'm watching it dubbed. And they're like, ah, okay. I don't, honestly, there's nothing wrong with the dubbed anime. The thing is, that it was taking too long. Sub or dub, the anime is taking too long. So I decided that I would read the manga instead and like thinking about it, like that's the way that the story is originally told, right? So I'm just going to read it the way that it was originally told. I mean, I don't really have much to say about it. Like, um, well, okay. The one thing I'm worried about is I love the music in One Piece. I love, like there are some moments with the music that just get me like so hyped. I remember at the end of the post-war saga, post-war saga, at the end of the post-war arc in the anime, it brought back We Are. And I remember I was like so excited. I, I probably like teared up a little bit because it just like, oh, it was so, it was such a great moment. And so I'm worried that like, while I'm reading it, I'm going to miss that. I read that part in the manga and like it was just like the hat on the little stand and like there was no music of course there's not gonna be music it's a manga there was no way for me to tell that when this was animated it was made to be momentous and so i'm afraid of missing those moments and moments like that so i guess i'll just have to be more aware of when something big might have happened and it's like it's not about the fights like i could care i don't want to say i could care less about the fights but like the fight scenes aren't the scenes that get me super excited. And I know some people can be like, oh. Like that's just the best. I'll say my favorite fight to watch so far has been when Luffy beat Crocodile in Alabasta. And I know that some people are like, oh, there have been so much better fights since then, but like, it was because of the music. They were playing, um, the sweet, um, New World Symphony. They were playing the New World Symphony. I don't even have to say anything. You watch someone get their butt whooped to that song. It is magical. How am I supposed to know which scenes have that? So maybe I'm gonna have to go back and watch it eventually, but I don't know. I'm reading it. I'm excited to be reading it. I'm also, I, I'll miss the music. The Brothers flashback. So I was mad sad when Ace died. I was doing all of the math in my head as far as like anime deaths. From what I've seen so far, I've taken my prior knowledge and come up with some factors that need to be present in order for an anime death to be valid. 
And so one of those factors is a flashback. You need to know the whole entire story of a person before they die, or at least you need to know a lot about them. And like considering how much we knew about all of the other characters already in the storytelling that Oda does, Ace dying with as little knowledge that we knew about him, um, that he was just Luffy's brother and we didn't know that much about him, that was not tracking for me. I was like, he's not dead. He hasn't had a flashback yet. And then we get right into the post-war arc and boom, flashback. We got to see Ace and Luffy growing up together and like this whole thing kind of gave me like, I don't want to say closure. It's not that serious. <laughs> Amy, some prior information that I realized that I figured was necessary in order for me to accept this character's death. We see them growing up together. This was truly needed at this point in the story. Garp takes Luffy up to Mount Corvo to live with the Dan after Shanks leaves. I realize this is why when Luffy first shows up, he's like, I hate bandits because he's like literally fresh from being just killed by those other bandits that were in Winmo Village. Ace is already there and he is just a little turd to Luffy like right off the bat. Ace, we got you a new brother. Thanks, I hate it. Ace just spits on Luffy immediately. He just sees the kid and he just spits on him from a distance, which is impressive, but also incredibly disrespectful. Luffy has already this unconditional love for Ace. He keeps following him around like no matter what happens. And Ace realizes that this kid isn't going away when Luffy's getting tortured by the Blue Jam Pirates and he doesn't snitch. He has to be rescued because he's just not gonna say anything. This is because Luffy had three options when he went to live with the Dan, and that was either stick with the bandits who he hated, follow Ace through the jungle and get bit at and attacked by animals and junk, or he could face loneliness. And Luffy said that he would rather get hurt than be lonely, which might be a contributing factor to why he fights so hard to keep his friends. I think that this might actually be one of Luffy's biggest fears because he's saying it from a young age and you come to present day and he is absolutely destroyed about Ace's death. And the only thing that is really consoling him is that he still has his crew. He still has people who are around him who are in his life, like Ace is not the only one anymore. I mean, of course he's gonna be sad that his brother is dead, but it's this loneliness that is like creeping up on him that I think he also fears. Let's talk about the Ace, Sabo, and Luffy dynamic. They high key remind me of the Powerpuff Girls. Ace is Buttercup, Luffy is Bubbles, and Sabo is Blossom. Change my mind, you can't do it. Ace was so hostile to Luffy, and it was only because of Sabo interceding and telling him to chill out that he helped Ace and Luffy build up their relationship together. And I don't know if Ace and Luffy would have been as close as they were without Sabo, but I think it's, I think that the real start of Ace and Luffy's relationship was so sweet because it was after they rescued Luffy and Ace was asking Luffy, you need me? You want me to be alive? And Luffy just like, <laughs> Ace hadn't encountered many people who answered those questions positively for him. He would, we saw when he was always going around to people asking them like, what do you think about Gold Roger's son? Like, hey, what would you do to him? They're like, ah, we beat that kid up. Oh gosh, that little sack of turds. He's just gonna, he's just gonna die in a fire one day. I don't know, nobody liked him. And then Luffy comes around, he likes him unconditionally. No one had answered that question positively except for Sabo, potentially. It would be nice to see how Ace and Sabo became friends, given that Ace pretty much hated everyone around him at the time. But being Sabo's brother, I think helped Ace in a way. And then being Luffy's older brother and having someone to rely on him and look up to him, I think both of those things helped Ace want to live. So let's talk about the nobles of Goa Kingdom. So Sabo is the son of nobles, and that really says a lot about his character. He was born into this wealthy society and he was being raised by these people. He was immersed in their culture, their way, of life but he could still see that living around actual trash was still better than living around actual trash and it's Sabo who first relates being a pirate to freedom because he wants to be free from his society that he was born in 
and the only way that he can do that is by leaving. He said he wants to be a writer also, so I love him now. When it comes to the burning of Grey Terminal, Sabo is incredulous that everybody knows about it. Everybody in the Highland knows that Grey Terminal is about to be burned. If these people in Grey Terminal aren't walking around like it's a normal day, then they're walking around happy because they know that their city is finally going to be clean. When in reality, the trash in their area is just going to build up again and they will never be clean. One man's trash. I think it's a neat little society that Oda made, the Kingdom of Goa, with the nobles in the highland, and then you have Central Town, Edge Town, and then Grey Terminal, where all the trash goes. And it says specifically where all discarded things go. After that, there's Mount Corvo, and then Windmill Village, where Luffy was born. And I feel like it's important that Luffy and Ace grew up around discarded things because in Grey Terminal, one man's trash is another man's treasure. The discarded things get chosen again eventually and then used by the people who live in Grey Terminal. I think it's here that Luffy learns to value things that other people don't see value in. In thinking about this, I'm thinking about his crew. When we first meet Zoro, he's chained up about to be executed. Nami was seen as a traitor to her village. Usopp was a menace to his village. The pirates on Sanji's ship didn't like him because he was always picking fights with the customers. Chopper was seen as a monster. Robin was a fugitive. Frankie terrorized Water 7. And Brooke pretty much was stuck where he was, but he felt he couldn't return to society because he was a skeleton. And all of them have been discarded in some way, and yet Luffy saw value and goodness in them, even when they didn't see it in themselves at Usopp, protecting Luffy. When Grey Terminal is burning, Blue Jam got betrayed and realizes, surprise, surprise, he was lied to by the nobles. He finds Ace and Luffy and decides that he's going to stop them from leaving out of spite. He's just like, what are y'all still doing here? We're gonna die together. He starts asking them about their treasure and Ace like tells him where the treasure is. He's like, that's not important right now. We need to leave. And then they capture them and Blue Jam starts talking bad about Sabo and Ace gets pissed off and then someone hurts Luffy and that really pisses Ace off. And Ace uses his hockey, makes everybody pass out. On accident, of course, because he's a kid. But when Dadan comes, Ace stays and says that he won't run away. Very much the scars on the back are the shame of a swordsman. And later when Dadan asks Ace why he didn't run, he says that he thought doing so would cause him to lose something he'd never be able to get back, which is like honor or pride, possibly. He also said that Luffy was behind him, and as long as he was standing there, no one would hurt Luffy and Luffy would be safe. And this scene is so similar to Ace's death in the Paramount War. Blue Jam lied about Sabo, it pissed Ace off. Akainu lied about Whitebeard, it pissed Ace off. But in the flashback, we have that extra element of I'll never run away that seems a bit more noble than Ace just being like, what'd you say? What'd you say about Whitebeard? And this part, like thinking about the connection is making me like upset all over again because they were getting away. They were getting away at the Paramount War. So like, why didn't he listen? I feel like the flashback should have provided more of an explanation, but to me it just, it, it produced more questions. And so maybe he didn't run away because he's always been the protector ever since he was a kid and he wasn't built to run away. But then he got punched in the back anyway by Akainu through his white beard tattoo why why was he facing Luffy and not Akainu like he could have gone like but instead he went like like why like I don't I don't get that that like that's something I haven't figured out yet because turning his back on his enemy is out of character but the story has shown that protecting Luffy was also very much in character for Ace. So why are his movements out of character, but his behavior is in character? And I don't think it's something like, because it represents that his pride in white beard was his downfall, that's why he got punched through the tattoo because I think there's more to it than just pride. I don't know if you have an idea, you can put it in the comments. Maybe it's because Oda just thought it would be cool to draw Ace like that, draw a fist protruding from his chest and just hurt us real bad. Sometimes that's all that it is. Why are we talking about Marine Ford anyway? Sabo's death. 
Sabo did not die. He did not. And this is different than me thinking that Ace didn't die because Ace died. Sabo did not die. There is so much other stuff that I would believe before I believe that Sabo is dead. I believe that Sanji wakes up in the middle of the night and shoots Robin and Nami, jumps off the ship, swims away. I'd believe that before I believe that Sabo died. That's kind of graphic, that's really violent. Um, I'd believe that Zoro found the One Piece a while ago. He just can't remember how to get back to it and he doesn't remember what it was really when he first saw it. I'd believe that before I believe that Sabo died. I believe that Luffy is dreaming this whole time before I believe that Sabo died. This isn't just because I've seen pictures of adult Sabo, but he's also on the cover of chapter 596 with adult Ace and adult Luffy. But I have a theory as to what happened to him. So it's not a matter of Sabo dying. It's just a matter of how is he going to come back after we think that he's dead. And I think I've got it down. In chapter 586, Sabo meets Dragon and tells him that he is ashamed that he was born as an aristocrat. And Dragon tells him that he will never forget what Sabo said. And Sabo's like, my words matter to you. And Dragon's like, of course, young one, whatever dragon would say and then in chapter 588 sabo decides to set sail and his ship gets shot by a celestial dragon in chapter 589 it specifies that this is after the celestial dragon came to port and goa kingdom but it shows dragon's ship dragon shows up on his ship and eva's like dragon you're late and then someone else on the ship says hurry up and get some help this is terrible so my question is what's terrible why was dragon late what was he doing? Was he fishing a little aristocrat boy out of the ocean? Dragon meets this kid in Edge City next to the Burning Gray Terminal who's crying his eyes out, saying he hates it here, he wants to go. I don't think Dragon just left him there. Like, why would he do that? Especially when right after he shows up to Gray Terminal and says, pretty much anybody need a ride. And all the people from Gray Terminal went on his ship. Like, there's no way he left Sabo there. And maybe Sabo's like, if I get taken, then my dad is going to hunt you down because that's what he did last time I ran away. And so Dragon's like, okay, so you need to die. And he's like, I know a way that you could die. You could go right out to sea in your little pirate ship and ride out right when the celestial dragon is coming. Dude's going to shoot at you. And Sabo's like, okay. And so they figure out a plan that involves... Sabo faking his own death and then getting rescued afterwards by Dragon. So I believe that Sabo is currently living in Baltigo with the Revolutionary Army and Dragon and that's how we're going to meet him again. And this would also mean that Robin knows him because that's where she's headed right now. So that's my theory. I'm pretty sure I'm right. I am, I am pretty darn sure that I'm right. I haven't been this sure about a theory ever since I started watching this show, but I'm pretty sure I'm right about this one. The Straw Hats and where they are now. Everyone has been put into a place that will allow them to grow or somewhere that they are needed, thanks to Kuma. And I was right about that theory too, that he's a good guy. Um, he is working for the Revolutionary Army. I didn't predict that, but I did know that he was a friend. And so this is where things get kind of fuzzy for me because I did watch the anime first and it tells stuff in a different order than the manga um but anyway here we go so Zoro is at the gloomy island with Perona and then Mihawks walks up and at first I thought it was him coming to tell Zoro personally what happened to Luffy at the war and I was just like oh my gosh I didn't know they were that close but turns out that Zoro is just chilling it Mihawks house so that's probably the best place that he could be to learn more as a swordsman Nami is on this weather island with all of these knowledgeable old dudes who can teach her about weather in the new world. Usopp is on this island where everything is pretty much out to get him and it's kind of like his mental state but personified so maybe after he leaves here he's gonna be like nothing was as bad as that. Sanji is in the Kamabaka kingdom which seems to be his worst nightmare but also a place where he won't get distracted and a place where he'll want to leave because I'm sure if there was a single woman on that island he wouldn't want to leave. Chopper is on this island where he's needed as both a doctor and as a human animal translator and 
also a peacemaker, Robin, is she was first in, I think, Tequila Wolf, where they needed to be liberated um, because they were working on a bridge and there's all that stuff. Um, but now she's with the Revolutionary Army. They probably have a whole bunch of secrets out about the world that she'll need to know. Frankie is on Dr. Vegapunk's island. He's an inventor who I'm sure we'll meet later because he's been mentioned a whole bunch of times by now. And then Brooke is a prisoner in the Long Arm Kingdom, but he is kind of chill about it. He's playing them songs and stuff, so he's okay. The New World New Leaders, Garp and Sengoku are resigning. Aokiji is taking Sengoku's place, which is good. I'm okay with that. He's the, he's my favorite out of the three and like really the other two kind of pissed me off. So, I mean, pissed me off is a strong word, but they do. Smoker wants to get transferred to the Grand Line. Doflamingo did something to Moria and now the newspapers are reporting that Moria is dead. Whitebeard is dead. People are treating the areas that Whitebeard had control over as up for grabs. Um, the new world seems to be sucking for everyone except for Kid and Blackbeard. And Law hasn't even gone to the New World yet. He says it's not time. I don't know if he's waiting for Luffy. I don't think he's waiting for Luffy because he seemed kind of like, I helped him because I wanted to help him, not because we're friends. I don't know when the right time for him will be. But Luffy is off training with Rayleigh to learn more about hockey. Rayleigh gave Luffy a short instruction on hockey. Um, there are entirely different names for hockey depending on if you're watching it or if you're reading it. Observation hockey is called observation hockey in both forms and that's where you can kind of tell what's around you and be able to dodge it. Armament hockey is also known as the color of arms hockey is um, the one that you can use to attack people. And then there's conqueror's hockey or the color of the supreme king hockey which only Luffy has. No, let me let me be clear. Only a few people have it and Luffy is one of them. And this one is the one that like, intimidates people and makes them pass out. And so I'm wondering what Kobe's hockey is called because I think Rayleigh said there are only three. But Kobe's hockey makes him uh, kind of hear everyone around him and all of that. So I'm wondering if that's just a really strong observation hockey or if it's called something else entirely. Either way, I'm happy that Luffy is finally going to learn how to control this. What makes me a little sad is the fact that it's going to take two years to do it. And I know that two years is a logical time frame when it comes to how much the crew needs to grow in order to take on the new world, especially since Oda spent the last few arcs showing us exactly how weak they all were. But it always makes me a little sad when I see friends separate, not because they want to, but because they have to and they can't be together even though they want to be together that it's going to take a minute. Stories like that, I don't know, they always get to me. But I also love how everyone immediately knows what they need to do in order to get stronger, in order to get strong enough to actually go to the new world, especially Nami, because she's telling the old dude that she's working with, and she's like, my captain is an idiot, and I am his navigator. I need to be able to know everything that I need to in order to get him wherever he wants to go safely. She just knows, like, I'm going to make him the King of the Pirates. I need to know as much as the navigator of the King of the Pirates crew would need to know. And I know that everyone is going to be so much stronger when they all get back together, but that also means that their problems are going to get bigger too. But I'm enjoying all of it and I think it's going to be fantastic. So this is the time skip. I think that means that I'm about halfway now, but the story's still being written, so maybe I'll be perpetually halfway. But it's funny because I'd always see the post time skip crew and it's like, like I had no sentiment towards them at all. I was like, I don't know you. I don't have memories with you. You're a stranger to me. Why is Robin white? What happened to Zoro's eye? I like Nami's short hair better. And I'm so glad that I'll finally be able to get to know all of these people that I've been seeing. Yeah. I'm just really excited to keep reading. But yeah, that's all I got for you today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Drop a like if you like this video. Leave a comment. Let me know. Stuff that I missed, I tried to get everything. I know I didn't get everything. But yeah, just let me know in the comments what you think about my Sabo theory. I'm pretty sure I'm right about that one. Ah, I like I'm feeling I'm feeling real good about that one. How else would he do it? Is another thing that I'd like to see. But anyway, I've been Meanie Mosey, and I will catch you all in Fishman Island. 
Bye.